offender. You were sentenced to life without parole in 1989 for a second degree murder conviction out of Rapides Parish. Is that information correct, Ms. Harris? Yes, ma'am. All right, Ms. Harris, would you answer Mr. Roche's questions uh, after his presentation? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Ms. Harris, how are you? I'm fine. Good, just give me a second. I'm gonna pull up your information. Um, yes, okay, Ms. Harris. Mm -hmm. Madam Chairman, board members, before us this morning, we have Cabrina Harris, DOC number 128149. Mm -hmm. She is here this morning seeking a recommendation for a commutation of sentence for the original charge of first degree murder. And because of a plea deal, she uh, pled to second degree murder and received a life sentence without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension and sentence. She's currently 56 years old. At the time of the offense, she was 23. Ms. Harris, we're going to focus on the offense in your statement when you apply for clemency a mm -hmm. little bit on in the presentation, but I'm going to enter some information. And if any of this information is incorrect, please correct me, okay? Yes, sir. First, let's talk about the community, the legal community's view and the victim's family, which is your family's yes, sir. Position, position on this clemency request. The mm -hmm. Rapids Parish District Attorney's Office is strongly opposed to any clemencies due to the nature of this offense. Mm -hmm. The Rapids Sheriff's Office strongly opposes for the same reason. The Chief of Police of Alexandria, Louisiana is also opposed. The victim's family, your family, mm -hmm. does not wish to share any comments or even talk mm -hmm. about the case in question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But your son, and the victim's brother stated mm -hmm. that he was just a baby and he doesn't mm -hmm. remember exactly what happened. Yes, but he would, he would love to see his mother come home. Yes, sir. This is the only arrest on your record. You have no supervision history. No. You have a low risk assessment, a moderate needs assessment and you are housed in minimum custody. Yes, sir. You have a good institutional record. What, what's interesting is, Ms. Harris, that your ACE score is zero. Mm -hmm. There's no adverse events during your childhood that would explain the, criminal, the criminology in which you committed this crime. When you did mm -hmm. the extra interview, you said there was no advent, adverse events. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So uh, a little later on, we're gonna get into why this offense happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you have an excellent disciplinary record, only one class B write-up in 33 years of incarceration. Mm -hmm. You also have four class A write-ups for a mm -hmm. total of five write-ups in 33 years of incarceration. The mm -hmm. last one was in 2016, mm -hmm. some six years ago. You mm -hmm. should be commended on your disciplinary record. Mm -hmm. You've completed the literacy program in 2009. Other programs yes, 
include uh, the victim accountability letter. Tell us who mm -hmm. you wrote the letter to and what did you have to say in the letter to the victims of this offense? To the victim? Well, you wrote a, you wrote a victim accountability letter. Do you remember that? No, sir. Okay. Let's move on then, okay? Okay. Other programs you completed include yes. Life of a Single Mom. Yes. 100 Hours Pre-Release. Living in Balance. Yes. Anger Management. Mm -hmm. Partners in Parenting. Yes. Life Healing Choices. Yes. And Celebrate Recovery. Yes. Notice yes. that you've taken multiple substance abuse programs. Let's talk about drugs. Okay. When, when did you start using drugs? I never used any drugs before. So you never done drugs. You've never done drugs? No, sir. Had you ever abused alcohol? No, sir. So tell me why you took Living in Balance and Celebrate Recovery. Because I wanted to, before I come to the board, I wanted to um, let y'all see that I did take some classes while I was locked up and that I was interested in those classes. So you have never taken any illegal drugs? No, sir, never, ever. And you've never abused alcohol? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. You've taken so many classes, Ms. Harris. Mm -hmm. I want you to give the panel some idea of what you think your level of rehabilitation is today. Today? Yes, what do you think that your level of rehabilitation is and what part do those programs play in your rehabilitation? Um, parenting. Okay. I, enjoyed, I, I enjoyed my parenting class because they taught they taught us a lot about um, how to deal with children and well, like if a child be upset not to Heard it and all of that, and be and be all uh, fuzzy with them. And they taught us. I I don't re quite remember everything that they taught me because it's been a while. I took that class in two thousand and seventeen, but they taught. I learned a lot in that class, and I kept all of the papers that they gave me. Miss Harris, tell me about life as a single mom. Life as a single mom. Yeah. I didn't. Think, I don't think I took that class. Well, it's, it's it's in your it's in your um, list of programs. Oh, it is. Oh, I didn't remember taking it. Okay. Um, that, that's a, that's okay, Miss Harris. Um, okay, Miss Harris. What part? Tell us what what you think your rehabilitation level is. Do you think you rehabilitated? Yes, sir. 32 years in the pr in prison. I am very rehabilitated. Yes, sir, tell I me, am. Tell, tell me why. Because I'm older now and um, I have Christ in my life and I'm doing really good in here. I'm working. I'm, I'm doing stuff. I was going to school, but I got out of class because I was trying to get build my scores up so I can go to a Holocaust. I want to take a college class before I come to the pardon board, but I didn't, my uh, scores wouldn't go up because I always been a slow learner. Okay, I understand that. But you haven't achieved the GED yet, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah I, I, I finished high school in 1984. I graduated finished, from Tioga I, High School. You have a high school diploma. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Well, it was misleading because the education director 
put, put a certification in that once you finish the literacy program, that you probably would not go any farther. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you did. When did you get your high school diploma? 1984. 1984. Okay. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. now, Miss Harris, this is going to be um, a delicate situation, but I read the official police report. Mm -hmm. I read the autopsy report. Mm -hmm. And I read your statement. Mm -hmm that you submitted with your application. And you were mm -hmm. uh, helped by Ms. Sandra Starr, am I correct? Yes, sir. And in that statement, you say that um, your, your, your daughter had um, defecated on herself. Yes, sir. And that she needed a bath and she didn't like taking baths. Yeah. And you made a caveat that you knew the water in the apartment in the apartment was extra hot. I didn't know, yes. So so you turned on the cold water and the hot water so it wouldn't mm -hmm. be too hot. Yeah. But still in all the baby was was burnt to the point where the entire body was red. Yes, and I pulled out the tub. Went on to say that you you were frightened, mm -hmm. afraid to call the police or ambulance, and you put your your four year old daughter to bed. Yeah. And next morning, she was still. Yeah. But after reading your statement, I read the police report and the autopsy. And you left out very important details that mm -hmm. was included in the autopsy report and the police report, such as mm -hmm. when the authorities approached your apartment, there was a foul odor emanating from the apartment. Mm -hmm. The apartment was in disarray. This kitchen sink, the bathroom sink was stopped up. There was standing water on the floor. There was a cut off ponytail in the ba bathroom sink. In the bedroom, there were two mattresses on the floor one had a pool of blood mm -hmm. and there was blood all over the sheetrock, the ceiling and over the door. Well, that's not, that is true, sir. Well, sir, ma'am, I'm just giving you the information okay. that right. was included in the police report. Yes, sir. And that you did not include in your report. No, because it wasn't true. Uh, then I read the autopsy report mm -hmm. to say that your daughter died of congested heart failure mm -hmm. from the scurling of the hot water. Mm -hmm. But there was also signs of head injuries, abrusions, okay. bruises. Um, mm -hmm. It mentioned that your daughter was undersized mm -hmm. for her age for a four year old okay. to weigh between 20 and 25 pounds that's drastically underweight mm -hmm. and the autopsy report also stated that she was chronically neglected and that happened over a long period of time so Ms. Harris, this is the opportunity. This panel this morning would like to know exactly 
would happen that day, April 12, 1989, in the six to 18 months before that, because this child was abused prior to that day. Mm -hmm. You just had moved out your mother's apartment mm -hmm. three months before this happened. Mm -hmm. So tell this panel this morning what really happened that day. Well, what really happened that day is my daughter had used the bathroom on herself and she was still in Pampers and I draw some water and I had just moved in that apartment, like you said. Ms. Harris, let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. Why was a four year old in Pampers? Because I, was, I wasn't trying to potty train her. I didn't take time out like I did with the boy, with my oldest son. And she was kind of hard to potty train because I would sit her on the potty and she wouldn't do nothing. Okay, okay, continue. Okay, and on that particular day, sir. Ms. Harris, Ms. Harris, mm -hmm. let me ask you questions because I think you're gonna have a narrative that's not gonna get to the bottom. Okay. Where, where did all the bruises, abrasions, and conclusions come on your daughter's body? I mean, I did it. Where did all the head injuries come from, Ms. Harris? The head injuries? Yeah. I, I didn't know she had head injuries. They according to, told me that was. According to the autopsy, yeah. Okay, where, huh? according to the autopsy report, she did. Okay, did where you? did all the blood in the children's room come from? There was no blood in the room, none. Okay. I promise there wasn't. Okay. Were there mattresses on the floor? Yeah, there was mattresses. That they, uh, people had donated me some mattresses until I was able to buy the children some beds. Okay. So, so your 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 version is that there were there was no blood. Uh, on the mattress, the sheetrock, and the ceiling? No. Okay. Okay, now, why would a mother with three children I think one one was six, one was four, and one was One year old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that call the authorities on nine one one. You were aware how serious your daughter
daughter was injured, why didn't you call the thug? Because I was afraid. How does one who's a mother of three children put a four-year-old in a garbage bag and carry her across the street and put her under a tree and put boards on top of the bag and then call the authorities. Now you call the authorities and say that your house was broken into and your daughter was kidnapped. Mm -hmm. Tell. So you had some reasonable awareness of what you've done, and now you're trying to hide it. So tell me, how does one do that? I know I was a bad mama. That wasn't right for me to do, sir. And I am so sorry for my actions back then, but I, I was so scared. And I knew if anything happened to them children that I was going to go to jail. That's why I didn't call the ambulance or the police. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you exactly what's on my mind, Ms. Harris. Yes, sir. You have a son that's approximately 39 years old. Mm -hmm. And you have a, another daughter, am I correct? Mm -hmm. That should be around 34. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost sure that your children are married. Yes. And they have children. Mm -hmm. And you have grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you really come to the realization and accepted exactly what you did that day and months leading up to that day. And I think you might be a danger to those grandchildren because all grandmothers and grandfathers babysit at one time or another and sometimes for days and, and weeks. And I'm not really sure that you've come to terms of the seriousness of the crime you committed. And you just might be a danger. Uh, Never hurt my grandbabies. But you had a four-year-old that was chronically 
collected was seriously injured and you didn't take care of that child. I know I confess that I was a bad mama. I confess, I admit that I were. And I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I know this has been painful, mm -hmm. but I, I, I needed to get you to realize the seriousness of what you've done. Mm -hmm. Because in your statement, you made when submitted the application, you neglected to put in the things that you felt that you were responsible for. And you told us the story that you wanted us to hear. Warren Thomas, do you have any comments, remarks, or observations? Um, yeah, just um, that Ms. Harris, you know, does have a good disciplinary record. Um, her last write-up was in 2016, which was prior to the flood. Um, she's living out at the Hunt site, and, you know, we don't have any real issues um, with Ms. Harris here at LCIW. Thank you, Warden Harris. I mean, Warden uh, Thomas. Um, Madam Chairman, that concludes my presentation. And I do have a recommendation in this case and I will share with my fellow board members at the conclusion of this interview. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Ms. Jackson has questions. Good morning, uh, Ms. Harris. How are you? Good. Okay. I just have a few questions. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that you might not have the family support that's so important for a successful transition. You've been incarcerated for uh, a long time mm -hmm. and transitioning back into um, you know, the free world is always difficult and it's especially difficult if you don't have uh, good family support. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, you, you know, who comes, who comes to visit you? Or who's uh, come to visit you? Well, my son can't come visit me, but um, I have some church friends that came to see me. No, no, I mean family. Family, well, my mama used to come see me. They all used to come see me back in 1990s, but when my mama got ill, nobody started, nobody would come see me, but my son um, uh, take care of my, my financially and here my money. He sends me money every now and then, and my daughter does too. I don't know why they don't want, they won't come, they won't come. For one, my son was arrested when he was real young. And for something he didn't do, he okay, was just but, there. But that was, and, that was a long time ago. Again, yes, if you don't have people who are coming to visit you. Yes. Where would you even think that you would live? And how would you support yourself? Where do I think that I would live? Mm -hmm. Well, with my son. How do you know that? I had I asked him. Well, does he have a wife or someone who lives with him? Yes, sir. And you, yes, don't, you don't think that would be a problem for his wife or his um, no. girlfriend? I don't know if he's married or not. You know, she come and live with him. That's always stressful when you know someone else comes into your home. Well, I don't plan on staying, I wouldn't plan on staying there forever. I was gonna get my own place. How are you gonna do that? Huh? How, how are you gonna do that? And once I get on my feet, get me a job. What, what kind of job do you think you can get? Uh, I like working in kitchens so... and and stuff. Right, but that's that's a low paying job and it's, you can't you can't live on your own based on that. Do you understand that? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know I've been locked up for so long. I didn't know it was a low paying job. Yeah, things are very expensive now. Very expensive. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate you at, uh, talking to me and answering my questions. Okay. Well, that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Harris, is there a statement you'd like to make to the full board before we vote? Um, well, I just want to say that I'm sorry 
for my actions with my little girl. I'm sorry for um, messing my life up and coming to jail. And I hope that y'all forgive me. And I pray that God bless y'all. And I'm going to stay with God for the rest of my life. I'm not leaving him. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good Christian right now. And I love the Lord. And whatever God's will is for me, it shall be done. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I think we're prepared to vote. Mr. Roche will be voting first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ms. Harris. Yes, sir. This is a difficult case for me. It really is. Um, I understand your circumstances. And I understand them well. And maybe the biggest mistake that you made when you were 23, you moved out of your mother's home. Because mm -hmm. I'm almost sure your mother helped you with the kids and everything. And once you moved out, the burden of taking care of three kids was overwhelming. Uh, you were. You were probably unemployed at the time because you had no electricity in your apartment. Um, and you were not capable of handling three uh, small children on your own. You have served 33 years of your sentence. You've done well. The disciplinary record is yes, excellent, and you have that in your favor. You've taken programs. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to learn because the report indicated that you had no GED and no high school diploma, but you do have high school diploma in 1984. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, Whatever happens after this hearing, I want you to get with the warden or the classification officer and try to get some vocational training. Try to get get some training so when you do get out mm -hmm. and you release, you have some skills to do a job other than work in the kitchen. Okay. If you get culinary, culinary skills, you can be a, a chef, but just working in the kitchen will not support you. Um, your programs are good. So I'm going to give you an opportunity for release. Thank you. But I'm not going to, I'm going to put it off two or three years okay. so that you have a chance to uh, get some vocational skills, some okay. job skills. Okay. So when you are released, that you have a means of supporting yourself. Okay. The family, hopefully your family will come to support you. They will not oppose, okay. but they said they had no comment. Okay. So I'm, my vote, Madam Chairman, is to commute Ms. Harris's sentence to nine, nine years. Okay. With parole eligibility after serving 35 years. Okay. And Thank you, Mr. President. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Wise. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. This time I'm going to be voting tonight. I'm voting tonight. There's very strong law enforcement, the DA's opposition, the nature of this crime of a four year old little girl. And uh, I think you need more programs and a mental evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Ms. Jackson. 
Oh, Ms. Harris, this is a very difficult case. Uh, not just because of the nature of the crime. And like Mr. Roche said, mm -hmm. we can see how something like this can happen. It obviously shouldn't happen, but we can see how it can happen. But my concern is that you're not equipped to be released. You're just not. And to, to be honest with you, I don't know, you know, how long it will take for you to become equipped. You know, you're, you're 56 years old. Mm -hmm. You haven't acquired, during the time of your incarceration, you haven't acquired any real marketable skills. Uh, you've struggled um, with, you know, you had to be discontinued from the GED program because you weren't making progress. And so I'm concerned about how well you could do in some of these classes. And, you know, without family support, you're just not going to be able to, to survive out there. You can't. You just can't. And so, um, because of the uh, strong um, law enforcement opposition, because you don't have a viable transition plan, and because you don't have any uh, employable job skills, I think to put you out uh, now would, would basically render you homeless. That's what would happen. I don't think it's realistic to think that your son's wife or girlfriend or whatever his status is going to be real happy with having his mom who's been in prison for 30 years come into their home. I just, I think that's unrealistic to expect that that will be a smooth transition for you. And so today my vote is gonna to be to deny uh, because of the uh, opposition from law enforcement that you don't have a, a, a place to go and you don't have any job skills. And I think right now you're in the best place that you can be, all right? So my vote today is to deny, but I wish you good luck, okay? And keep working on maybe getting some employable skills and, you know, reconnecting with your family to see if you can get their support. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Marabella? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ms. Harris, uh, as, as everyone has stated, your case is a very, very difficult case. It's a very, very sad case for all sorts of reasons. Uh, uh, you've done well while you've been in prison. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree with everything all of my colleagues have said. Uh, I don't know if you will ever be able to get what you need to be able to survive on the outside. Uh, I don't know, in my own personal opinion, whether a denial is appropriate. Uh, I, I think that that it's possible you could get some skills and you could work and you could do some things while you're, you're in prison. So uh, without reiterating everything all of my colleagues have said, my vote today is going to be to vote to uh, commute to 99 years with parole eligibility after 35 years and hoping that you can get some programs, you can get some things, you know, maybe a mental health evaluation or something that, that might be able to help you get some skills once you are released to be able to stay out. So I, I hope. Okay. I, I, I hope that regardless of what happens today, you continue to work hard to try to get to that point. Good luck to you, ma'am. Probably will. Right. Ms. Harris, um, you've received a split vote. You've received two votes uh, which are favorable to grant your request and two votes to deny your request. Mm -hmm. So because of it, it's a split vote, the outcome is that your application for clemency has been denied. And I think you've heard everyone here today say, keep working hard, try to get work with the folks there at the facility, get you some marketable job skills. And if you're able, reapply when you're eligible to do so. Good luck to you, ma'am. All right, thank you. Warden Thomas, I think that- So let's unpack this. First, I didn't think in a hundred hearings, but I find myself agreeing with Jim Wise over Mr. Alvin Roche. 
I'll get into later how I can unpack what he's thinking, but I don't agree with it. The bottom line is she has a life sentence. They're going to commute to the governor, recommend to the governor to potentially to commute her sentence, to set her free, to start. Her game plan is to move in with her son who has children. How can you trust this woman to be in the same vicinity as children? How can you take that risk? I don't understand that. According to her own admission, according to the reports that they use, she had no indications in her past that explains why she did what she did. That was her zero score. She was completely sober, according to her own admission, and they're taking that for face value. Yet she tortured, and it is nothing less than torture, her own child, her daughter. Bruises all over her body. Her ponytail cut off and stuffed in the sink. Dropped in a bath and burnt and picked up. Put in a garbage bag and thrown out in the street like trash. She weighed 20 to 25 pounds. An average four-year-old should weigh around 40 pounds, according to Google. I mean, we're talking about... That's, that's bones and skin. She was torturing her baby. Then you say, okay, well, she's been in prison for 32 years. You know, people change. They become rehabilitated. But what about this hearing show you any rehabilitation? Mr. Roche asked her, so tell me about the accountability letter you wrote for your victim. She said, what letter? I don't remember. She doesn't even remember writing it. <laughs> She, you're saying that she went and wrote a letter. If you had remorse, if you had regret, and you don't even remember writing the letter. And maybe she remembers she wrote it, but she doesn't remember what she said. So she just says, she, you get it? It's the same thing. That's, that's, is that not all you need to know right there? Then she talks about the ch the children class, why she took... One of her programs, because she took so many programs, parenting class. And she says, I learned not to hurt it. She refers to a child as it. And to be fuzzy wuzzy with them. Here, I, I, I saved the place so we can listen to it together. Um, parenting. Okay. I, enjoyed, I enjoyed my parenting class because they taught they taught us a lot about um how to deal with children and well, like if a child be upset, not to hurt it and all of that and be and be all uh fuzzy with them. And they taught us. I I don't re quite remember everything. That they taught me because it's been a while. I took that class in 2000. And you're going to send her home to be with grandchildren? How can you? How can you risk that?
at anyone who knows who watches this with me and knows we love Mr. Roche. I adore Mr. Roche, Mr. No Way Roche, but I cannot wrap my mind. This has got to be. the most confusing aspect of I, I just don't understand it and you know everyone's human and it could be that it, that 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 night he went to bed and said wow thank goodness that 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 she was denied i don't know what i was thinking but i just i i don't see how one could take the risk on what I think can only be described as, as a monster. Shh. I did not see any remorse. I did not see any accountability. You know, so often the board would say, you can't even get out because you haven't taken accountability. Where is the accountability? She denies that there was blood found on the mattress, on the tiles, on the roof of the bathroom. This was a slaughterhouse. This was out of the worst nightmares. This the, the police that had to see this probably see having it, one of the worst cases they've ever seen. She put him, her in a garbage bag, took her across the street, covered her, and then called the police and said she was kidnapped. And she did it because she was afraid. You know, Mr. Roche said to her, I know that this has been a painful process to rehash everything. But I don't I don't think it was a painful process for her. Did did we see a tear? Did we even see a fake tear? Did we see any type of remorse? There was nothing. There's nothing there. It was it was one of the worst interviews. I did not see a single redeeming factor. If you want to see redeeming factors, she had a few write-ups. She took programs. I don't consider those redeeming factors because we know we know that that it is the the the, the it is an indicator that a large percentage of the time the most the most twisted of of monsters, sociopaths, psychopaths, they don't get write-ups. I mean, this it's a it's a fact proven thing. It's not it's not even an opinion. And taking programs, I don't even even on her own admission, she took it for the board. Not that it, you know. Who's to say, Mr. O'Shea thinks you know she 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 left. She, going now going through what what his thought process might have been or what I think he just explained it. She left her mother. She wasn't prepared. Didn't have electricity. Couldn't afford it. it. She wasn't. She was dealing with three kids. She couldn't handle it, and she snapped. But how do we know that she just didn't get get deviant pleasure out of torturing her daughter? How can we rule that out? And if you 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 don't you don't want to rule that out, how can you trust her to be with her grandchildren? Oh, because she promises she won't hurt her grandbabies. Okay. You promise. We feel real great now. We just saw you lie throughout the entire hearing. We saw you take no accountability. She made sure to put in a written statement she knew that the apartment 
had very hot water. So she put cold and hot water because she's such a great mother. Even describing her dead baby that she killed on her hearing, she said that it, she wasn't potty trained because she was harder to train than the boy. Not than her son. Harder to train than the boy. She would just sit there and not want to go. And she says it with like a. And I want to thank Claire, uh, uh, one of our, our members and subbies. And she, she's uh, been writing me for some time now. She recommended this case. Um, I said, Mandy, you got to check it out. She said, monsters really do exist. And. Yeah, I agree with you, Claire, and and thank you for for sending this. This is and you know just the added aggravation of every second she was saying yes, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm to Mr. O'Shea, and I was waiting for Miss Renasa to do her thing and say stop talking. You know that's a Miss Jackson saying, but to say. You know, you need to 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 Miss Harris. You 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 have to be silent. It was just so aggravating, and and as I was he hearing the crime, it was compounding. My blood pressure was going up, and I wanted to scream. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I don't have documents on this. It happened, you know, just so many years ago. Uh, it wasn't on the internet and I didn't give it Richard a chance to, to go do some deep dive into it. I just wanted to get this hearing done. But like, I, I agree monsters do, do exist. And, and I, I, I do hope that she is never given a chance of commutation the risk, the risk, you know, it's like you don't just need to end the life of a child to cause damage. What do you think she will do just being around children? Do you think she's gentle? She learned to be fuzzy wuzzy with it. No. Mr. Jim Wise, I'm sad to say it, but this is the first time I agree with you over Mr. Roche. Hey, if you didn't see it, you might not believe it, right? But with that, I'll let you go. Joining us uh, there, let's see, is uh, Reverend Nash, wants to speak on your behalf. On Zoom, we have uh, Katrina Clean, the Primus of Justice. Oh, I'm sorry, you have counsel. you have counsel with you this morning, Ms. Harris? No, ma'am. They did not. They're not here. I just have, uh, I have it listed on my, you have promise of justice as an attorney who will be joining us by Zoom. So uh, we'll see when, at the appropriate time. Lakeisha Klein uh, also wants to speak on your behalf, your sister, Tina Bash. Um, so I'll read some identifying information into the record and then we'll start our interview process with you. We'll hear from the warden uh, and then we'll hear from the folks who've indicated they'd like to speak. And at the end, you'll be allowed to make a statement if you'd like to do, do so before we vote. Did you understand all that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Harris, you're classified as a first felony offender. You're currently serving a 40 year sentence. Uh, you were sentenced in December 1997 for manslaughter in Madison Parish. You have parole eligibility August 10th, 2023, and good time date is November 25th, 2031. Does that information sound right to you? Yes, ma'am. Right, your case has been assigned to Mr. Roche. Would you answer his questions? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Ms. Harris. Good morning. Good. May I call you Ms. Clout? 
Can you call Miss Clara? Yes, sir. Miss Clara, you're currently 45 years old. You're first on the offender, and you served 25 and a half years on a 40 year sentence. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you became eligible for parole due to Act 122 of the Louisiana State Legislature. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I see why you've earned 465 days of good time. Yes, sir. So we'll talk about your programs a little later. And we'll talk about the 365 days that you lost in good time. Yes, sir. For all the time you gained through your programs, you've lost because of disciplinary problems. Yes, sir. We'll talk about that a little later. The crime that you committed happened on November 13th, 1997. And you were arrested eight days later. Yes, sir. And you pled guilty to manslaughter. 10 days after that. Yes, sir. So within 18 days, you committed a crime, you were arrested, and you were convicted. What was the rush to judgment? Well, I don't understand. Most convictions happen within 6, 12, 18 months. 10 days after you were arrested, you pled guilty and was sentenced. First of all, you were arrested for first degree murder, then you pled to mass slaughter and pled guilty 10 days later. Tell me why the rush to judge Because they told me if I didn't take the first degree, take the first degree murder, I would get the death penalty if I didn't plead guilty. So I plead guilty. The manslaughter. To keep from getting the death penalty. Okay. okay. And that, that and the DA was giving you an ultimatum at that time. And if you didn't do it at that time, if found guilty at trial, you would get the death penalty. Yes, sir. Okay. Miss Miss Harris has no warrants. She has no supervision history. I think this is the only arrest on Miss Harris's record. Is that true? Yes, sir. Uh, opposition in this case comes from law enforcement. Uh, Sheriff Sammy Bird. Uh, Sheriff Bird entered a statement. He says. He feels like Ms. Harris has not served enough time for paying for, to pay for her debt for her deceased child. Now, our parole officers could not find any written documentation on exactly what happened. So would you please give us your version of why you've been incarcerated the last 25 and a half years. Okay. I wasn't supposed to have him. My auntie had custody of him. Hey, tell me who him is. My son, DeVecchio Rayshawn Harris. Okay, he was two years old. Yes, sir. Okay. So tell me. I wasn't supposed to have him unless I was supervised with my aunt, with the social worker. But she called me to come get him to spend two days with me because I was out from work. I was working at Wendy's and I was out for two days. So I went and got him. Okay. Why did you have to be supervised with your two year old? <laughs> because he was took from me when I was, after I had him like 
I got pregnant at 16. I had him at 17. Like two months after I had him, he was taken away from me. Why? Because I had got in an altercation with one of my cousins, and she called the police and said that I slammed him in the seat, which it wasn't true. And they called the police and they took him to the hospital and checked him out, but wasn't nothing wrong with him. Okay, okay. I understand. Continue. Sir? You can continue. I understand. So I, I went, I, get, I went, <laughs> hold on just a second. <clears throat> So I went and got him. He was already hurt. Something was wrong with him, but I couldn't, by me not being a mother, didn't know nothing about a child, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Something was wrong with his leg. Okay. So when and you, I just so when you went to get your son from your aunt or his aunt, he seemed to be injured. When you went and picked him up, he seemed to be injured. Yes, sir. Did you take him to the hospital? No, sir. Why? Because I was young and I, I didn't understand. Being a mother, I didn't understand nothing about a child. I was a child myself. Okay. So I didn't. So what happened to your son? What happened? Okay. I. I had anger issues and I lashes, I used to lash out a lot. So I had an argument with my boyfriend and I I hit him. I hit him with my open hand. I hit him in the chest and on the side and on the leg. But it wasn't intention. I wasn't trying to hurt him. It's, it's, I just spanked him. Okay. And I thought he went back to bed. I went back to bed. I got up. I went. So when they got us something to eat, when I came back, we ate. And we played with the other children that was in the house. I was living with someone else. I was living with my boyfriend and his family. And he played and he played. And then that evening when he woke up, he said he was hungry. He all, when he get ready to eat, he always say he want to eat, eat, eat. That's what that's how he say he liked to eat a lot. And when he woke up, his mouth locked up on him. I didn't know what to do, so I panicked. I was shaking him. He was throwing up. And I called my aunt, and I told Jeffrey, I said, something is wrong with him. He's not he's not breathing, and he's not talking. So she told me to call the ambulance, but by the time I called the ambulance, he died in my arms. I wasn't... Miss Clara, let me get this straight. You were living with your boyfriend, you were angry with your boyfriend, so you whipped your two-year-old, he went to sleep, he woke up hungry, and his jaw, his jaw locked up on him, and then you yes. just sh shook him. Yeah, I was patting him because he was vomiting, trying to stop him from vomiting. Which was the wrong thing to do. Well, so I didn't know at the time. I was just trying to help him. I didn't know. So you got he died in your arm before. I take full responsibility. I know he died in your arm before medical assistance could arrive. Yes, sir. Okay. According to this record, this is the only arrest on uh, Ms. Harris's record. Ms. Harris, you were 17 or 18 years old, but tell me whether any drugs or alcohol abuse at that time? No, sir, I do not use drugs. No, sir, I don't you do never, alcohol. You never use drugs or alcohol? No, sir. So basically, it was a bad home environment. You were living, living with your boyfriend, got angry with your boyfriend, and you sort of took it out on your two-year-old. Yes, sir. We have a victim statement, and the victim, um, I think it's uh, Ms. Jacqueline Sanders. Yes, sir. Contacted, and she is unopposed to your early release. 
That you should know that. Uh, tell me about the programs that you've completed. Sisters Keepers, Living in Balance, Prenatal Class, Life Here in the Choices, Celebrate Recovery, Cage for Rage, Parenting. Breathing Support Program, Project Metamorphosis, Life Support, Trauma Healing, Pre-Release, and Victim Impact. And I'm in school getting my GED. Okay, and you the dyslexic program too. Also. Yes, sir. That's they helped me get my GED online. Yes, sir. Okay, now have you finished the victim impact training? I, I have one class left. Okay. <clears throat> and Warden Thomas, I do have a letter from Miss Christy McGovern saying that she's in a GED program with dyslexic, and she gave me the possibilities, but I'd like to see her continue working on that GED. Absolutely, yeah. sir. Because it will be a tremendous help at the age of 45 if she is released. Yes, sir. Uh, you have a low risk assessment, you're housed in medium custody. Uh, tell me about the Kairos weekend. Oh, it was a blessing. I, I had a lot of unforgiveness and bitterness because of the things that happened in my life. So I Ask God to help me because I didn't know how to forgive for the things that I hurt. How I hurt my son, it wasn't intentionally. I'm very remorseful. I'm sorry. I apologize. I didn't mean to hurt him. So I've learned how to forgive people and just I'm it just helped me how to forgive. Ms. Harris, I see that you have a great transition plan with Kingdom Recovery in uh, West Monroe, Louisiana, Ms. Tina Bass, and I've dealt with Ms. Bass before, but I, I, I want to see something better for you than fast food restaurant as a place of employment. If you get that GED and Work towards, I like to see you have uh, higher aspirations than working at McDonald's or Burger King. Would you like wouldn't you like that? Aspirations I'm working at a fast food restaurant. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, work supervisor had no issue with you, uh, security, no issue, and classification officer had no issue. You have a low risk assessment, as I said, but my first concern is that you have a high needs assessment. And a high needs assessment tells me that you will have a difficult time if you release because you have high need. And I'm, let me see if I can find that. Education, anti-social thinking, and peers. Yeah, and anti-social thinking. Yeah, and that, that's a concern for me. But uh, we will try to deal with that uh, in in my decision. Uh, one second, let me get back. Let's talk about your ACES score. There is a instrument for female offenders, which gauges the criminality in which they're involved in. I've never seen a score of eight on the ACE evaluation. That's eight negative things that affected you as an adolescent 
that they be responsible for the criminality in which we see in you. So uh, what negative events, activities, or uh, interactions did you have growing up that caused you to become angry? Molestation, abuse from different family members, and rape from my own family members at a young age, a child being raped by a man. Your parents were separated or divorced? Yes, sir. Yeah, you had people that drink and use drugs in the household? My mother didn't have custody of me. My mother lost custody of me. I was living with my grandmother. Okay. My grandmother raised me. And you had members of your household that was incarcerated? Yes, I had an uncle and a cousin. So, okay. So all those negative things affected you as you were growing up? Yes, sir. How do you feel about those things now? What have you done in the last 25 years to correct those negative impacts it had on your early childhood? I have prayed and asked God to forgive me and I'm no longer the same person that I was. I don't have anger issues as I used to have before. Okay. Ms. Clara, and I have to talk about this disciplinary record. You entered incarceration in what, 1997? Yes, sir. And you first write up when you got to LCIW was in June of 1998, and it says threat to security. And that raised a red flag for me. And then he's write out the word, you are threat to security. What did you do when you first was incarcerated that caused them to think that you were a threat to security? When you were a threat to security, it was one of your first write-ups. Can you recall what it was for? Oh, because I made a statement that I no longer wanted to be there, so they say there was a threat. I wasn't supposed to say that. I had just first got my time. I had just arrived and I made a statement. I was crying and I said, I didn't want to be here. And she said there was a threat that I wasn't supposed to make a statement like that. I didn't know I had just came. I had just arrived. Yeah. But I didn't yeah. know you couldn't say that. They say it's like an escape, escape risk. Now, Ms. Clara, I'm going to be very honest with you. You have well over 200 disciplinary write-ups in 25 years of incarceration. That's an average of eight write-ups each year of incarceration. And I wouldn't be as worried about that if most of them were in your first 10 or 15 years. But you've had close to 40 write-ups in the last 10 years. The last 10 years of your incarceration. The last one, was a very serious write-up, a 21E. And everybody here knows what a 21E is, so we don't have to talk about it. But it's a very serious write-up. Destruction of state property. Aggravated disobedience. You said you controlled your uh, anger. But in 2018, you had a fight. 2018, you had two fights. 2017 fight, contraband in 2016, defiance in 2015. You had a write up every year except 2022 in the last 10 years. Yes, sir. So tell me why all the defiance? Sir, I, I didn't have no hope. 
I thought my parole, I wasn't expecting this parole date for the 2045. I thought my parole date was going to be in 2031. I, I wasn't expecting this. So, so to be heard so, this early. So I, I didn't have no hope of going to the board at all. Ms. Pat, let me stop you. Because you didn't have any hope of a parole date, you decided you were going to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And the rules didn't matter. Your oh, rehabilitation didn't matter to you simply because you want to do what you want to do. Is yes, what, sir. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir. In, in 2021, you knew you had a parole date? No, and sir, I just received my parole date. You knew you were going to be eligible one day. Am I right? Yes, sir, but not this soon. I thought it was 2031. Yes, sir. So you, you just continue doing what you want to do, regardless of the rules and regulations. No, sir. According to this record you did, it is a lot of violent and aggravated offenses. Yes, sir. 21E, destruction of state property, fighting, 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 aggravated disobedience, defiance, disrespect, misconduct. Yes, sir. I'm very remorseful. Juan, Juan Thomas, do you have anything to say? Uh, I mean, you know, she does, you know, have all of those disciplinary write-ups, as you have mentioned, but she has really started to try and make a turn in the past year and a half. Um, we actually had her recently um, reduced to minimum custody, and she's working up here in our administration building. Um, so she's actually doing really well working with staff and um, tending to the needs up here. As we kind of discussed already about the literacy program and dyslexia, she is still very dedicated to her education and working towards receiving her high set at some point, hopefully in the near future. Um, she is low risk and Ms. Bass can probably give a little bit more information, um, but she does have a pretty solid transition plan um, that she has um, solidified if she, is, if she does get um, a favorable decision today. So in the last two years, since the July 21 write-up, she's been, she's had a turnaround. She has, yes, sir. Um, she really has, um, I think kind of something has resonated with her that, you know, she has to make a few changes around here. She's actually been helpful for some of the other, um, she's not a mentor, but she has kind of taken, you know, a few inmates under her wing and trying to give some guidance to some of those who are more recently coming in and having some disciplinary issues. So I think, you know, it is taking a turn um, and she has done what we've expected in the past couple of years, like I've said. How long has she been working in the administrative area? Um, two months. About two, two months. months. And, yes, sir. About two months and a half. Okay, what was your job before that? Uh, I I was in housekeeping and in a yard, and then I went to school. I was just going to school in the morning and not the evening, but now I go to school all day from seven to three. I'm in school all day. Okay. Now, in Ms. Bass's letter, say that you have a one year um, stay at. Uh, Kingdom recovery, but she said you can stay longer if you need. What is your permanent residency plan? Where do you plan to live on a permanent basis after Kingdom recovery? What would be a permanent residence after Kingdom recovery? Where would you like to go? Monroe. I'm going to stay in Monroe. Monroe, Louisiana. I'm going to stay in Monroe Which and group? finish getting my education and give me a job and go to church and just do everything possible that I can to stay out of trouble. Who you live with? 
Who will you live with? M me. Do you have your own home? I'm going, I, I want, after I leave the transition house, I'm going to have my own place. Do you have your own house? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to work towards getting my money to have my own place. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Um, is there any comments from the from the guests at LCIW? I'm trying to make any statements. Can they say anything? Mm -hmm. Uh, is um, it's hard to hear you, but I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you can hear me. I'm Carol Williamson, a volunteer chaplain. I have been uh, at LCIW for 11 years, oh, over 11 years. And I have uh, spent some time with Clara and, uh, and I feel like she's made a lot of progress um, as a, um, a victim of child molestation myself, I can resonate with her. And I was angry and it's a miracle I didn't go to jail. I'm just saying when you're molested as a child, it's so damning. And it's, uh, I was full of anger and bitterness and, and I was miserable, but thank God I got saved. And that changed my whole destiny. And when I got in church and I learned the Bible and I can resonate with her about the forgiveness because it was so hard for me to forgive my father who molested me. But, you know, you can't have peace with God if you don't forgive others. And so that's what I emphasize with these girls. You have to forgive. God won't forgive us if we don't forgive others who hurt us. And I feel like she's made a monumental um, uh, progress in this area. And I believe that, that, that she's, she's ready and that she's going to be an asset to society and she's going to be able to help others. And I guess that's why I'm in the prison ministry for 27 years. I was a chaplain in Texas is because my heart is for women. And so many of the women here have been molested and and treated horribly and it is it is horrible to have to deal with that even as especially as a child and so my desire is to invest in the lives of these women and and help them to see there's hope and faith in god and that he can fix everybody who will come to him with a humble heart and willingness to make their wrongs right and ask for forgiveness and go forward for Jesus Christ. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, so Miss Harris, are you still working on forgiving those who harmed you as a child? You still working on that? I, 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 I'm, I'm a Christian now. I read my word and I believe in God. I have forgiven everybody that have harmed me. All right. Well, yes, ma'am. All right. Um, let's hear from is um, Miss Bass. Can we hear from you, please? Um, I feel that we have the perfect avenue for Miss Harris to be able to come into in a stress-free environment that we can take and love her and connect her back into a community that she has no clue what it's like out here. And we can walk side by side with her and get her into a support group, counseling. We can continue her education and help her get her GED. Um, we can place her in a good uh, environment to work in. We do that, all the helping on budget and saving and preparing for her future as far as uh, teaching, her, getting her in driving classes, teaching her how to drive, getting a driver's license, all the steps it takes towards getting her into her own, her own environment and her own home one day. And we're not stressed on, oh, it's got to be a year and you're out of here. It's however long it takes her. We're willing to house her and keep her. Great, thank you so much for, for that information. We appreciate it. Can we hear from uh, Ms. Lakeisha Klein, please? I feel like um, Clara is ready to come home. It's time, she's my big sister. She's been gone most of my life. And as our older siblings, I feel like she'll be a great role model in this family because it has been very hard since we lost our parents. 
<laughs> she um I've talked to her over the years on the phone and from what I see she really has changed for the better because I'm I'm a real hard sister and I know I would tell her what's right from wrong if I feel like it's wrong I'm gonna tell her and I feel like she's changed and I think she'll be an asset to this to this outside world to this out to this society we love her and we miss her and we've been praying for her to come home it's time for her to come home I feel like she learned her lesson um she I feel like she's learned her lesson. She's been there too long. It's time for her to come home. I'm ready. We ready to see her. We couldn't travel to St. Gabriel, but I know we'll be able to see her in Monroe. I'm proud of her with all of her education. And she she'll be a great access to this society. She'll be a great access to this society. Please, y'all, let her come home. All right. Well, thank you, ma'am. We appreciate it. And uh, I have Mr. Nash. Are you with us? Is he with us? Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Harris, is there, is there a statement you'd like to make before we vote? Yes, ma'am, I do. Um, I, I take full responsibilities for my actions. I'm very remorseful. And I apologize, the ribbon effect that I caused on the victim, my family, and the community. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Here to vote, Mr. Rochelle. Yes, ma'am, Chairman. Ms. Harris. Yes, sir. Warden Thomas can tell you that this man right up. Cause, causes me to deny more people that I'm a disciplinary. I like people who's gonna follow the rules. Because following the rules is, is, is a way that the uh, staff and the ward can, can control the offenders. And with over 200 write-ups in 25 years, that's totally unacceptable. Yes, sir. In the last one, being on only two years ago, very serious. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I take full responsibility. Ms. Harris, I, I'm delivering my decision, okay? I know you do. And I know you're remorseful. And I know you're trying to make a change in your life. I realize that. I see it in your face. I see it in your community. What I'm trying to do right now is to give you a way to get released. But I have to recognize that your disciplinary conduct is unacceptable. So based on what I see this morning and what I've gotten from this interview, I'm going to vote to grant your release conditionally. Condition on that you continue in the GED program. You complete the dyslexic training and that you have no write-ups in the next nine months. Yes, sir. Now, if Warden Thomas or Ms. McGovern see that you're not capable of earning that GED after eight, eight and a half months. I'm gonna waive that condition based on a letter of certification for Martin Thomas. You understand me so far? Yes, sir. But I will not waive one 
single solid disciplinary write up. If you get a disciplinary write up, this will be revoked. Yes, sir. Warren Thomas, can you take care of that for me? Yes, sir. We're good. Mrs. Wives. Uh, Ms. Harris, I have this. I just want you to know I've been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yes, ma'am. It, it hurt me that you didn't have any hope, but you had Kairos and you had other programs that you called out that you took, but you didn't see those programs that giving you hope. And that was a concern for me. But when the chaplain spoke and she recognized it's where you are, I want you to make uh, uh, that swing me a whole nother way. Uh, you still have work to do, and you will have a lifetime of work to do. And I'm glad to know that you've forgiven the people who harmed you. And that's all you can do is forgive them and, and walk forward. So my vote is to grant uh, conditionally as well as to work on the high set uh, and, uh, and uh, stay in the transitional program to the transition program only. And that uh, you enroll in general counseling about eight months after release. Stay with yes, the counselor. She have, a, she have a lot of stuff to unpack. Uh, yes, ma'am. But that's my vote. All right, Ms. Harris. I, uh, I agree with my colleagues. So my vote today is to grant conditionally. And I won't repeat everything. I, I will send you a copy of it. And the folks there can help explain it to you. So you got some work to do. Work hard. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. How do we unpack this? So we have one hearing that takes place a few years ago and another hearing that takes place 9-11-2023. I didn't know that both hearings existed, but I thought after seeing this one that I put them together. It's interesting to see the contrast between, well, Mr. O'Shea makes a different decision in both. One has the, the highest uh, show of trauma at a level eight that he's ever seen. The other had a zero. I, you know, they, they both claim to, to have never drank or done any illegal substances. Clara, who we just saw, appeared to me to show remorse. She cried. She called her son by his full name. It, it seemed like real remorse to me. I, I'm always skeptical because we have to be aware that We are aware that people that people that 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 especially she is anti so she tests high for antisocial thinking so we know that that can can be an act uh but also the big problem that we have here in my opinion is as mr o'shea stated i thought maybe he should have held those cards closer to the chest by not revealing it was we have no records and you know richard couldn't find anything either there, there's nothing that exists the crime happened so many years ago and so you know we we don't know how much of even what she said is true but what we do know is that she apparently had to was only allowed to be with her child under supervision and she states that oh she put the baby in their heart and then they called the, the hospital and there was nothing wrong with the baby and say like, okay please you don't you, they don't just throw around child services don't they don't just throw around oh oh because someone said that you you put the baby in the car seat all of a sudden now you can't even spend time with your own child so we know that's not true this mother had uh done something so serious to her son that they 
made it a requirement that he, she can't even be alone with her son. And then for the short time that she has the opportunity, she does so much damage to him that she ends his life. And we can only imagine that what she did to him was absolutely brutal. If we had the reports, if we had the information, a baby doesn't just... And then you look at all of the write-ups that she has, including, I, I believe, the, 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 it was the, I think it's an aggravated um, sex offense, which was the one they didn't want to mention. I believe, I'm not 100% sure. But that might be the first we've we've heard of in a woman's prison for that offense. And you know what's just scary about that is how do you trust someone who has so many deep rooted in their core issues? To the, to the extent that they can beat their own child. And the way that she said it, too, is like, my boyfriend pissed me off, so I beat, not even that, so I spanked my child on the leg, on the back. It was like this nonchalant. I want to hear it again. I want to hear it again, uh, what she had said happens. Hang on out a lot so i had an argument with my boyfriend and i i hit him i hit him with my open hand i hit him in the chest and on the side and on the leg but it wasn't intention i wasn't trying to hurt him it's, it's, i just spanked him okay and i thought he went back to bed i went back to bed i, I got up i went to win to get us something to eat when i came back we ate and we played with the other children that was in the house. I was living with someone else. I was living with my boyfriend and his family. And he played and he played. And then that evening when he woke up, he said he was hungry. He all, when he get ready to eat, he always say he want to eat, eat, eat. That's what that's how he say he liked to eat a lot. And when he woke up, his mouth locked up on him. I didn't know what to do, so I panicked. I was shaking him. He was throwing up. And I called my aunt and I told Jeffrey, I say, something is wrong with him. He's not, he's not breathing and he's not talking. So she told me to call the ambulance, but by the time I called the ambulance, he died in my arms. I wasn't. So, Ms. Clown, let me get this straight. You're living with your boyfriend. She hit him. With an open hand, she spanked him, she says, three times. She didn't take him to the hospital when she knew something was wrong with his leg because she was only a child. It's just... It's just hard, it's just hard to wrap one's mind around how a mother ends the life of her child and i don't see any accountability in what she's saying i mean really it seems like she's trying to pass the blame on someone else when she got her child from someone else it, she was hurt she didn't take him to the hospital because she was a child herself then her boyfriend uh made her upset so she hit her child with an open hand and everything was fine. They were playing. He went to sleep, and then he choked. And she called someone instead of the cops. And then, but, and it's like there's no accountability. There's no. I don't believe any of it. Like I said, if we had if we had proper reports and details, I'm sure we would see a very 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 different gruesome picture. And then you have on top of it all those 
and, and even from her own words, she only started doing better because you know she she didn't realize what she was saying and how bad that, how bad that even made her look. And uh, how can you expect? It's just it's about you know there's the punishment aspect of going to prison and and there's the also the 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 protecting and I don't but that's just my my guess thinking it out loud opinion I think that was interesting though if I had to pick between two I know that's a weird maybe a weird game to play but I would pick Clara over the previous one mostly because um she was going to go move in with her with her grandkids and and also I do feel that she had some type of demented pleasure in harming her her daughter and in here I do I I do think it was more of a uh um just taking down all that negative you know less of a demented thing and more of a an upbringing a result of an upbringing uh but i don't know again i'm just sharing my thoughts out loud um i'm happy to always be proven wrong and would love to hear your perspective on this hearing but with that i'll let you go